Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope all of you can hear me well. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join the webinar. I know there is so much going on in uh, each of your lives, personally and professionally. Uh, you know, we are all dealing with a reality that uh, you know, four weeks ago, none of us would have imagined uh, we would be living in. Uh, I do remember the first few days of COVID when people said, you know, we might have to be careful about flying. Uh, a lot of us thought, okay, it was a blip and that will get over uh, soon. But now four weeks down the line, I think we are all, I think one thing that is clear is that we are living in a new reality, you know, and that reality is not something that is short term. I think it will have long term implications. I think there is a lot of uh, deliberation and thinking at different levels of the world around what would this mean to us and how do we respond to it. Um, and having had a chance of being in multiple conversations around the COVID-19 reality, be it with donors, uh, governments, uh, companies, etc., we really wanted to use this webinar as a way of having a conversation with nonprofits on what does it mean to not just survive the COVID-19 reality, but thrive in the COVID-19 reality. And I think it is an important distinction because, uh, you know, for mainstream business, uh, there is always the impact of what this would mean, uh, you know, and what uh, from a from a view of business, you know. But for all of us in the social impact space, this is really an opportunity and a, a huge responsibility to make sure that people that we care about, people that we've committed to work for as part of our regular professions and our careers get through this time uh, effectively and well. And it's also one of those rare occasions where there is a collective consciousness around the mainstream, uh, the regular people, around how critical aspects like health, aspects like livelihoods, how serious are issues like migration actually today. So this is a, a massive opportunity for us to impact people at scale and to make sure that you know as a country we get through this effectively and that's really going to be the tone for today's webinar as well i think the the focus on today's webinar is not just to see how we can survive this crisis and that is important and we will focus on that but it's also to see how this is actually a massive opportunity um, for us to go forward you know um you know, ideally would love to have a meeting where all of us are in a room or in a conversation where I could see hear all of you. Uh, but given the, you know, social distancing uh, paradigm that we're all part of, a couple of suggestions on how we can make the most of this together. Uh, number one, from a go to meeting point of view, um, my request is for everyone uh, to not use video as part of this presentation. Um, I think it, uh, you know, all of us have, uh, uh, have family members in other meetings, kids in online classes. So video is a very precious commodity and I don't want it to get in the way of the quality of the webinar. So I'd request you to not switch it on. Uh, I think we've unmuted muted a lot of the participants to avoid any ambient noise. Uh, and as the meeting progresses, we can evolve that. The second is I want to assure all of you that the presentation, the form that you see in here are, uh, is going to be used um, and shared with you uh, post the webinar. Uh, so be, be assured that all the data or anything that we are using as part of this uh, presentation will be shared with all of you uh, and it will be accessible for you. The other thing that we would love to do is ideally we would love to make sure that there are there is interactivity and so on. Uh, but however, I think close to 160 people have registered for this webinar and I'm sure they are coming in slowly. Uh, it is hard to have a Q&A format. So I request all of you to go to this website called menti.com. It's M-E-N-T-I dot com. And please enter this code. It'll ask you for a code, uh, 615890. Yeah, uh, this is an online polling uh, uh, you know, tool. Uh, throughout this presentation, there are places where I would love to hear from all of you on how you are reacting to the crisis, what are you doing today, et cetera. And uh, while you know the chat is uh, the good forum, uh, menti.com allows us to ask specific questions and see how all of us are doing on this crisis. So either on your phone or on your desktop, if you can open a browser and enter this menti.com and use this code and keep it ready at the moment, 
at different times of the presentation, you will see this icon, Mentimeter icon, where you will be asked to respond to a poll, and I will take you through it as we go along as well. Thirdly, I think uh, the chat is a great way to just let us know what you're thinking, any questions you might have. Throughout the presentation, we request you to share your thoughts, your uh, questions with the organizers. Uh, I have my colleagues Rahul and Ambika on the call as well um, on this webinar. And uh, once my presentation is over, uh, we would uh, spend time looking at the questions uh, and make sure, making sure that uh, you know all your questions are answered as part of our Q and A. Yeah. So again, uh, please mute uh, your phones, uh, stop your videos. Uh, please go to menti.com and enter this code. It will say surviving and thriving in COVID reality. And that's what you will see. It's fine. And please use the chat window for any questions you might have uh, throughout the presentation. We might not take it during the presentation, but we will answer it all as part of the end of the presentation. Whatever has not been answered, we will look to answer that offline in some form as well. Yeah. Uh, just as a way of introduction, uh, the person on the left is actually me. That's how I used to look many years ago. Uh, it shows me that it's about time for me to refresh my profile picture. Uh, about us as an organization, we are a consulting firm with an exclusive focus on social impact. Um, uh, we've had a chance to work with a lot of you in person uh, as part of our engagements. As you know, we primarily focus on four key aspects. Um, you know, one is working with funders. This could be foundations, could be bilateral, multilateral organizations, or could be corporations and helping them um, maximize the impact of their social investments. So could, uh, you know, this could be through advisory work that we do, it could be through uh, the work that we do in actually managing uh, you know, a grant capital for these organizations and also through program evaluations and impact evaluations. The second part of our work, which I think is critical for today's presentation is we work to enable nonprofit organizations. Uh, we work with a wide range of organizations over the last 10 years in actually helping them scale the impact they have on the uh, on the ground through a combination of strategy but also in actually working with organization and implementing programs on the ground the third part of our work is research uh, uh, you know we fundamentally believe that actionable on ground perspectives on what is happening on the ground is extremely critical and want to make sure that uh, we anchor our research on the reality on the ground and take it to action and that is something that we do in partnership with both foundations and nonprofits. And lastly, we have a solutions vertical where we build products and solutions that we believe have significant impact on the social impact space. Uh, so we leverage technology as part of it and uh, also look at implementing innovative ideas on the ground. Uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about some of these at a, a later point in great detail as well. Uh, so with respect to time, we are at 3.8 at the moment. I'd like to spend about 40 minutes on the presentation. Um, so we will finish at about 3.45 roughly and uh, use the next 45 minutes for questions that you might have so that we make it as interactive as possible. Uh, it's time for your introductions. Uh, so this is the time when we go to Mentimeter. So my request to all of you is uh, go to the browser. Uh, Mentimeter, and you will have a list of options uh, that will tell us what would be a best description of you. Are you part of an NGO leadership? So you're an NGO leader. Are you somebody who's a, you know, who's part of an NGO but not part of the leadership? Are you a funder? Uh, are you somebody who's an ecosystem player? So you're actually somebody who works for an organization that, um, you know, uh, like Satwa or others, enables uh, the nonprofit ecosystem. Are you a student? We saw a couple of registrations from students as well, or is there something else that might describe you well? Yeah. So great. So we have a large part of our uh, you know audience being NGOs. So close to about ninety percent of the total population. Okay. Excellent. 39 people, 41 people voting so far. Okay. So, but, okay, let me give it a minute more and then we will move to the next question. Interesting.
a significantly, uh, you know, strong NGO population that helps and uh, uh, both equal participation from NGO leadership members, people who are part of the NGO leadership team or CEOs, and also people who are part of uh, nonprofits overall. That's great to know because then it helps us tailor our examples as we talk uh, to the audience as well. So that's, uh, thank you so much for sharing it. The second question I had uh, for all of you, I'm moving to the next question, is which sectors are you engaged in? So your browser should, uh, you know, shift automatically. You will see the next question. Uh, if some of you are working only in one sector, just please enter 100 there. So you just enter the number 100. That's 100% of your effort is in education, for example. If you do work across multiple sectors, you can divide that across, you know, in terms of percentages. What would describe you as, uh, you know, what percentage of your effort is going to different sectors? So it might be useful to understand that as well. So you might be 30% education, 40%. Livelihood, make sure it adds up to 100% overall. So we have a predominantly education heavy, uh, you know, audience, uh, health and skilling are next. Yeah, I'm very curious to know who others are, but I think we'll come to that as we go along. Okay. Great, I hope all of you have no trouble in accessing menti.com. Just go to the browser, menti.com, and you can use this code 615890 that you see on the top. Yeah. I think there is a significant environment and sustainability uh, contingent as well. We should have added that to the options. So I'm sure that's a, a huge part of what we're seeing as others. Okay, interesting. Yeah, a very small contingent of gender, which is surprising. Okay. So education, livelihoods and health being a significant part of it, and I'm guessing uh, environment and sustainability, I'm sure is a lot of the, the others as well. Um, okay, so skilling, livelihoods, health, great. Thank you. The last question as part of our introductions and something again, I would have loved to ask for all of you when if I had met you in person is the question on how are you feeling today? You know, what would be three questions that would describe how you're feeling right now, uh, given the crisis? It could be because of what's happening in your organization. It could be because of what's, uh, you know, what's happening personally for you, but in general, where are you today mentally? And it'd be great to hear three words. If you can enter three words. Tired, I can imagine. I think it's the new ways of working are getting to us. Confused. Okay. Anxious. Hopeful. I'm, I'd, I'd love, I'm happy to see hopeful there as well. Yeah. Excellent. Gratifying. That's true. I think a lot of us are still better off than so many people that are there that we are working for. So I think it's, uh, yeah, we are grateful for certain things as well. Yeah, we are safe and healthy, you know, and that, that suddenly is becoming so much more important for all of us. Okay, creative, I love creative. I think this is the absolutely the right time for us all to be creative as part of what we're doing. Great, it's amazing, thank you. Uh, you know how, it's amazing how at the center of it, there is anxiety and confusion, but there is also hope, uh, you know, right in the middle of it, which is amazing. Uh, and I think, you know, personally, if I had to share how I am feeling, I mean, you know, I've been, I can, I do like about 12, 13 calls a day, right? And I, and overall, I think there is a genuine sense of purpose, you know? Uh, there have probably been days where I've asked myself, what am I really doing? But I, I think not one of these days. I genuinely feel like there's a significant sense of purpose and that's really where I am. 
So thank you so much, all of you, for sharing how you're feeling. Great. I'm going to move back to the presentation now, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, maybe we should do this again at the end of the presentation and see how all of us are feeling, and see if actually the webinar helped us be more hopeful, be more creative, and so on. Uh, why is why is this becoming so important? Why is why are we talking so much? Because it's not like this uh, India when demonetization happened was a huge crisis as well, but it didn't have this ramification. I think it's probably for three reasons. Number one, it is a multi-dimensional crisis. You know, it is an economic problem. Uh, it is a social problem. It is a medical and a health problem. Uh, it is a massive governance uh, challenge, and it is also a global challenge. You know. Uh, when demonetization happened, it was a huge economic challenge which resulted in livelihoods being impacted, but our health, our education went on. Uh, it wasn't a global problem, you know, but it did have a significant ramification of who we are. But this, on the other hand, is a multidimensional problem. Second is it is an indeterminate problem, by which I mean we don't know when this is going to end. You know, uh, I think the American, uh, you know, who sounds now becoming a legend, Mr. Fauci said, you don't put a timeline for a virus. The virus puts a timeline for you, you know. And which is true. So we can talk about the lockdown ending tomorrow, two weeks down the line. But quite honestly, we don't know when this reality is going to change. It's really a health concern. And we still don't know whether the worst is beyond us, behind us in India. You know, as migrants leave, as doors open, uh, what happens to our rural infrastructure is still a large question in our minds. And third is the impact of this is going to be deep. Uh, it will, it is already changing the funding landscape. It was one of the most important questions a lot of you asked. But it's also changing how we behave as people, you know, what norms are becoming normal, what is not, uh, you know, what is not going to change. Uh, it also is shifting the way our, you know, our people that we work with are going to look at their lives and their, their work. And that's another important thing. So when we respond to a crisis like this, it's important to remember that A, we will never have all the answers for the immediate term. But at the same time, it's important to make decisions and move on. And the idea of this presentation is really that, is to help you, provide you a framework to look at both the challenge up front, but also to look at what are best ways for us to respond immediately. Safa's own response in this, and I won't take too much time on this, is essentially on four things. One, we are saying there is a lot of uh, panic. Can we put data out there for people to make data-led decisions? You know, so we putting together public data at the moment and making it easy to use so that people can make enough decisions we have public dashboards that we are working on a regular basis to share data in an interactive way second is we are orchestrating relief you know by bringing ngos together suppliers together governments together and seeing how we can make it happen uh, in terms of immediate relief opportunities we are also saying in the post covid world beyond the immediate relief it's important to look at issues such as social security livelihoods healthcare education etc and what are ways in which we can address it and we are putting together our thoughts ideas commissioning research to understand this and so on to really say how can we help the funders and nonprofit organizations navigate the new reality effectively and the last part of our work is really supporting nonprofit organizations in in tiding through this crisis and thriving in this crisis you know and a lot of what we are talking about today falls under the fourth bucket which is around support happy to take any questions you might have on the other three tracks as well uh, in the q and uh, in terms of the disruption, I think one, the points on the left hand side are very, very clear. You know, one, there is uh, financial sustainability risk and the safety risk, et cetera. And these are things that we are dealing with on a regular basis. But it's also a great opportunity for us to look at some things that as an organization, as CEOs, the leaders of the organization, you know, we've kind of stayed stalled for a while because we just didn't think it was important, in, you know. So one is really the question of relevance and our role in the impact space. There are probably things that we've always wanted to do, but we thought was not as important, but are becoming more and more critical now. You know, when you talked about gender, there was a significant focus on empowerment and economic empowerment earlier. But today, I think there is a stronger relevance on, uh, you know, violence and safety, you know. Um, secondly, social security, you know, it's something that people don't think is as important, but today you realize, how important is it in times of crisis like this? I'm sure all of us know the Wimbledon example of them having paid insurance for the last six years and now, you know, actually benefiting from it because of the COVID crisis. So, but I mean, that's a tennis tournament. Yeah, this is real life, people's lives that we're talking about and how insurance actually matters now becomes more important. So revisiting relevance of the issues we are working on, I think is number one. 
Second is it's an amazing opportunity for us to create innovative solutions to the way we solve problems. Some of the things that we do today are going to be short term. My own assumption is a lot of what we're going to do today is actually going to continue beyond the COVID time. You know, we will find new ways of engaging community that is not that is effective while at the same time not intensive in terms of effort. We will find new ways of collaborating as organizations. I do hope all of us travel lesser. I think the role of parents in education is going to be redefined. You know, when this crisis is over, I think social emotional well-being of children and women and people is going to become more and more critical after this phase of loneliness is complete. So a lot of new things are going to become critical, and we're going to solve those problems differently. Third is I think private sector is going to become a partner in collaboration because they will be facing a crisis and finding ways to solve problems that they've never solved before. And organizations that can find win-win opportunities and build trust and empathy with companies and other corporate players can actually find new ways of collaboration with them that might not have been possible. And the last is the way the funding landscape is going to evolve is something that we're going to watch as well because none of us know where it's finally going to land. Right now, it's you know it's one of those things that is rotating and you're wondering where it will stop. But for for sure, there are going to be new ways and new opportunities for us to access funding. And I think as leaders in the organizations and the fact that you've taken time to come to a webinar means you care about the larger ramification of this. <coughs> I think what is critical is to keep both of these lenses in mind as you look at your organization strategy. Overall, we've defined the role of, um, you know, the, the way, the framework that we've approached used for helping NGOs look at this crisis is three, three things. One is uh, what we're calling mitigate, which is, making sure that your people are okay making sure your organization does not get into a crisis mode making sure that you are your essential systems are running and your people are okay without being burnt out while they're working from home is all an extremely important part of the leadership's mandate at the moment you know and in the light of how do we change the world we can't let our house get on fire right so mitigate is really about keeping that view in mind adapt is more an immediate term response to this crisis you know how do you look at this, you know, while you're going to think of a strategy, while the world is going to evolve, you will have to act now and have a decisive or a response to this crisis that is both humanitarian and strategic to your organization. How do you do that is really what we're talking about in ADAPT. And the third part of it is pivot, which is how do you create a more mid to long term response to this crisis that ensures that you continue to be able to continue to be impactful and relevant when the you know dust settles and when we have a larger view of how the world is actually going to go so that's what we're going to talk about today and we have some content around the mitigate some on the adapt and some on the pivot as well happy to take more questions on it as we go to the q a and so on and i will now again in the interest of time move on to uh, mitigate first and for us mitigation is really four things so if you like you know if you are in an organization and you're looking to see how you can structure your team my suggestion is think of people or committees managing four problems. Yeah. One question is there should be somebody in your organization, if you do have a CFO or a head of finance <coughs> or a board member who's extremely good at finance, make sure that there is a committee that is looking at your financial sustainability overall. You know, the scenario planning is something that I think now is becoming common. There are articles on IDR, some really good ones. Uh, there are also resources that have come up now uh, around this. Uh, so Look at uh, you know how you can a what they call top line, which is reconfirm your commitments with your donors. Also reconfirm when they will be able to give you the cash because one is about having the grant on paper, and the other is about cash flow. Uh, second is try and save as much money as you can from your current grants. You know some of your current work might not be able to continue because of the reality on the ground, but find ways in which you can keep the money but repurpose it for the COVID reality. And most donors that we are talking to are open to that conversation because they want to find interesting ways of solving the problem. So if you can repurpose grants uh, and make sure that that conversation is had, I think that would be great. Third is put cost control measures. You know, I think NGOs have always said are great at thriving in limited capital, unlike most for-profit companies, which is why in most for-profit companies, retrenchments have already started. But even in non-profits, I think being smart about cost uh, optimization or not cost cutting is very, very critical. You know, think about what investments you have to make now. You know, buying an online collaboration software is probably a good idea right now. You know, ramping up um, some 
you know, as uh, data sticks because people would need to use them as part of their everyday work is probably a good idea. But if you want to do an event, uh, you know, and marketing expenditure, maybe a good time to postpone it. Rents, look at rent of your offices throughout everywhere. Please negotiate, have somebody negotiate or negotiate it directly with your landlords. Across the board, that is the first cost that everybody is looking at. And lastly, establish clear policies, not just for this week or next week, but for the next six months. Unless it changes otherwise, please tell people what is acceptable cost, what is not acceptable cost, because people need a compass to make decisions, and I think it's important to kind of create and provide it to them. The second part of it is employee well-being. You know, employee well-being really is not just about getting them to work from home. I think it's, uh, you know, somebody said it recently as part of a Harvard webinar on Saturday. I think it's, uh, as leaders, all of us should be able to tell people the truth and give people hope, you know, and not confuse the two. You know, it's the point about giving hope is not by not telling the truth. I think we should be as honest with them on where are we today? What is the impact on the organization? What are best cases and worst cases? But at the same time, give them hope. Tell them what is your plan? How are you approaching it? I think is a very, very important. And second is don't do it just once. It would be great to have quarterly employee all hands meetings. Uh, it would be great to ensure that there is some, your HR team is looking at some essential, uh, you know, well-being mechanisms, uh, finding ways to keep people engaged online and so on, because everybody is going through a fairly stressful and uncertain period. So I think looking at that, I think will be critical. Third is, especially if you're an organization above 60 people, um, enabling your managers to deal with their crisis at their own levels, but also to deal it for uh, deal with it for their employees, I think is important. As a CEO, I also see some of our nonprofit leaders trying to overreach themselves and work 20 hours a day. You can't sustain this. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So the more we enable our organization leaders to take responsibility of the people and ensure that no one is left behind in the organization, I think will be very important. Um, Safety and well-being of the program staff is especially critical because they are frontline workers who are at risk. And the last is think about work from home policies. Uh, you know, we were part of a webinar last week where somebody talked about how when you work from home and when you don't see your employees, you have to structure work differently. You know, you can't give large deadlines. You might have to break it into smaller tasks, take up smaller deadlines, create smaller teams. And I think thinking that through as HR leaders or as the organizational leaders would be very, very useful for you. For you. Third is stakeholder communication. I think one of the big risks uh, that, uh, you know, that we have at the moment is nonprofit because of the crisis start to look a lot inward and not focus on ensuring that their relationships are maintained and they're actively learning from what is happening on the ground. And again, you're in a webinar, so I'm preaching to the choir because you see the value of it. But with my suggestion is to think of a circle of peers that you can work with people who will tell you information on where where they are and you can tell them where you are because a lot of the information is going to be through informal networks rather than in very formal ways of communication you know and i think that's going to be very very important and the last is have somebody who's very good at admin and operations because we're going to constantly get calls for shutdown open the office risks you know, changes across different locations, we will need to ensure that our employee well-being is thought up and we are at least two steps ahead of the rest of the employees in terms of thinking about operations, IT, administration, finance, etc. So putting a set of meetings, I think there will be helpful and also ensure that you have a risk register. You know, if you can create 10 risks that you have to watch out for as a CEO, as a leader, as a member of the organization, say these are the 10 things that can go wrong Let's make sure that this doesn't happen and review that every week, pretty much. I think that will be a great way to ensure that we are not falling into anything that, you know, that we talked about, but we didn't follow up on. You know, I think this is, and if we can ensure that we are able to put this together uh, overall as an organization uh, across all of these four things, it gives us the cushion to then start looking at what should be the way to rebuild the organization, you know? So you secure your home, before you set out and understand what you can do to thrive and take control of the upcoming financial year. Yeah. I will again move to Mentimeter very quickly and ask all of you, having seen what you have just heard, how much of this have you been able to do already in your organization? Maybe on a scale of one to 10, if you can say how much, if it's 10, which means you've effectively implemented it already. If it's uh, zero, you've not even started working on it. Uh, because as different organizations, it would be great to see where we stand on this today. So if you are 
you know, a six or a 10, it'd be great to see how all of us are doing on this. Please press submit after you've done it so that we get a sense of where we are. Uh, overall, I think we are, we have more than halfway through across all of these different, uh, you know, uh, aspects, which is great to see. And, you know, as I'd expected, uh, employee engagement really is where we are doing better than other aspects as part of us. And it's also interesting to see how we have people across the entire range of uh, the process, you know, you, you can see that there are those that are at eight, but there are those that are at a five and a two as well. I think that's that's interesting to see. Yeah, employee engagement is really where I think we seem to be doing fairly well as an organization. Operations is probably where I think we are lagging behind. Um, great, maybe I'll give it another 30 seconds and then uh, shift to my next slide as well. Again, as you're voting, I think what I wanna share is, this is the boring stuff, you know? This is the stuff that has to be done but it's also the biggest risk for all of us. So ensuring, like I said before, having a committee in your team, having one person in your organization, watching for this risk overall at an organization level will be useful. And as you're even talking to your board, this could become a dashboard of how you are also, uh, you know, preparing for your crisis so that their ability to provide you guidance and response to this is also something that they, that becomes easier and more effective as well. Great, thanks for all of you to share, for, for having shared where you are today. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, uh, which is around how do we react to it? Now we talked about what you're gonna do internally within the organization, which is mitigation. But when you're adapting, I think I also wanted to talk about how do you deal with this crisis also from the perspective of uh, you know the program? Because today what we're also seeing is there is a, there is this, what people call in, you know, York language, FOMO, right? Like uh, there is a fear of missing out on what we have to do. So organizations are trying to do everything. So one of the things that would be helpful is to ask these two questions for yourself. One, please ask yourself, which of parts of your program are now more critical than ever in the light of the COVID crisis? You know, I know of an organization, for example, and from here on, I'll love to take more case studies uh, so that, you know, this becomes tangible as well which works on the skilling and the employability space. And they know for a fact that in the post COVID world, they will have lesser opportunities that, you know, they're, uh, the people they're working with, the young people they're working with, they have lesser opportunities. So they cannot stop their career counseling and the training programs because that will, now will be a really bad time to stop it. Similarly, I know of an organization that's working on sanitation, you know, and uh, hygiene. And now it's really the time for them to take this up with the community and see how they can help, uh, you know, work with them. Similarly, an organization in Delhi working with parents, you know, on engaging their children. Now when the children are locked out, uh, you know, and are, are at home all the time is now when the parents need the most support. So there are, in all of our programs, there are things that we know is urgent and important is actually the most desired response to the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. And the second is, it's not part of our program, but for the stakeholders that we are working with, that is really the most important challenge that they are facing today. You know, I know organizations working in schools and children, you know, most of their parents don't have food to feed their kids. You know, we are a non-education nonprofit, but the point is if they don't have food, then what are we really talking about? You know, similarly, you've been working with women and you know for a fact that there is more violence right now among women than ever before because of the lockdown and because alcoholism is gonna go on and go on the rise in the next few months, you know? So I think that is going to happen. So that's the second thing, which is really probably not issues that you're working on today, but it's really the most immediate challenge when you put your people, your stakeholders at the center of your thinking process. And the way you might execute both of these might be different, but as an organization, it will be important for the leadership team to take these two lenses and say, if this is what we have to do in the three to six months when the resources are constrained, when going on the ground is hard, when money might not be as available, what are some of the three to five things that you have to do 
which is the absolute and the most important thing you want to take you know the adapt mindset really ensures that you're not trying to do everything and win this fight you know it makes sure that you're trying to focus your energies on the most important things you have to do as an organization so keeping these two in mind will be very very helpful and one of the consistent questions that we've gotten asked is yes there is a part of my program that's urgent and important but we are not on the ground you know how do we do it and this is what we are seeing happen you know one is technology and i'm using the word technology in three ways here you know which is not a classic app on a phone one is i'm using technology to describe all forms of media you know uh, cable tvs you know uh, ngos in tamil nadu have started reaching out to local cable providers to see if some of the content for their children can be shared to cable television you know uh, second is uh, community radio short wave small distance community radio format can that be used cry for example is working with gramvani to spread awareness using the idr system of uh, gramvani you know and i know in many many colleges and education based ngos are now using a technology phones to share regional content you know uh, that is one which is really mass media second is connectivity solutions whatsapp groups you know conference calls you'd be surprised as to how easy it is to set up like we use uh, you know internal conference call facilities even without a smartphone getting all your women beneficiaries or your children or your teachers into a common conference call once a day to let them know what you are working on how they can deal with this what they can do i think can go a long way you know and how can you use some of that i think will be helpful the third is actually tel telephony you know which is telecalling support centers call centers etc which now have become ways for us to reach out to people so there are rural uh, you know bpo format that are still running some of whom are have their main street business is cut off there are people who have set up smaller you know four to five centers there are telephony solutions that help you create ad hoc um, you know uh, call outbound and inbound call centers i think looking at some of those will be helpful second is look at the champions in the village that who are there when you are not there you know could be community workers and members could be community leaders elected representatives lead parents you know in a community who have significant influence how can you engage them empower them to do more and the last is if you do absolutely have to ground and we know organizations that have to do it today organizations that are dealing with migrants largely make sure that you are taking care of all possible safety implementations and also getting government access and permission in wherever way possible i know this is a truism i know a lot of us know it but i think it's still important to put it out there so that uh, you know it's part of our thinking and planning process but when it's not part of your program structure you know uh, and it's not something that you're doing every day how do you approach that again like you said um, you know like i said earlier look at prioritizing the biggest challenge that the person is facing you cannot solve all of their problems today and you might have to pick up some immediate ones think about what is the unique capability that you have to solve that problem you know you don't now is not the time to do something that you're not really good at you know because it is going to be inefficient it is also not going to be an appropriate response and design your response based on that and see if there is a way this can be made relevant to a broader ecosystem what do i mean by that like a challenge could be lack of food or essential item you know uh, in the community it could be about um, you know disrupted livelihoods uh because they, maybe there is a need to provide just cash support and there are organizations looking to provide cash support and you have the access in the community you know it could be elderly people there are you just work with people in the communities where there are a lot of elderly people and there is high risk so what can you do to make that happen what could be your capabilities you know if your capability is that you fact that you have trust in the community you know that other people don't have uh work with a non-profit organization in education in mumbai oh, and that's what exactly what i told them is that ah i can i request everybody yeah so how can you look at uh, you know enabling your community because they have, you have their trust because they will trust you if you tell them to wear the mask and not go out which the police is finding it hard to do second is access to decision makers do you have access to government which you can actually leverage right now do you know donors very well who might not fund your program but might fund this immediate need so look at what are your unique capabilities and the response might not always be a program it could be crowdfunding campaigns it could be just getting other partners to work with your beneficiaries today it could be even designing incentives you know are there ways in which direct cash transfer can be done more creatively because you are a part of that process and you get them to look at ways in which 
you know they can adhere to good practices i think there are certain things that are possible in the way you design your response and some of it is already done teach for india running a crowdfunding campaign for their children's families is a classic example pratham is doing fantastic work given their access to the community today in terms of how they are responding to this you know arp uh, arpan for example a counseling based non profit organization uh, you know is using the counseling capability to provide mental health support to people in the covid crisis that's a capability that they have that they are able to leverage and then find a way to see if you can either share learning so that other people can follow it i recently saw this non profit organization a small one called ant hill where the members of their community their organization had gone down to provide relief they actually came out and did a, a simple video to talk about what do they find what do they not find where is the need for support you know then others can then build on it and learn from it which i think is a great idea as well so keep that conversation going to see the most important areas where you can provide the most relevant support i think that is going to be very critical and i think the other thing i want to add to adapting to this crisis is also to look at making sure that the communication and the stakeholder engagement doesn't stop you know organizations are doing things internally but not as much talking externally and whether we like it or not it is a time where everybody is reading signals in social media where having your work showcased as part of it is a great way for us to a support the peer community that we have but also reach out to funders to talk about the work that we are doing and three simple ways of doing that and i'm going to be short about this is enrich the evidence you know uh, which is if you can do a rapid data collection among all your beneficiaries or all your uh, members families mothers to actually say that across 3000 women today this is really the biggest challenge you know it informs execution because people don't have data today a lot of decision makers are working without data you have access to people and if you can provide something that can provide data that can eventually enable the people you are working with i think that would be great share any how to guidelines that you are creating i think enriching the evidence will be valuable second is create dialogues and this is not something that you have to do like a advertised webinar it could be even a small group session it could be members in the leadership team of a non profit organization starting to be part of smaller groups and sharing their learnings within those groups and then the community group sharing their learnings so that we learn from each other and the last is celebrate successes there is a dire need for positivity in this narrative you know it is this the media here today is designed to propagate negativity so celebrate everything you know celebrate something that's happening in your community which you are excited about celebrate a team member that's doing great work celebrate your peers you know an organization that you know is doing fantastic work talk about that work because that helps us create a culture of positivity among our circles which i think has a significant value as well so to quickly summarize what i shared as well i know i'm going a little bit fast i'm making sure that we have enough time for questions the first thing that i talked about was look at you know the most immediate uh, part of your programs that are more important today than less and find a way to make that happen talk to your donors about it but also leverage technology leverage your community champions and if you have to go on the ground with government permission and safety see if you can really make it happen so that you don't let go of this opportunity but at the same time if there is something outside adjacent to your scope but it's core and critical to your current key stakeholder and there is a way you can do that quickly you know and where you have a core strength please find a way to make it happen and talk about it in the ecosystem so that people a learn from it and the work and the visibility that you provide is actually helping your organization as well yeah um i want to quickly move on to mentimeter again just to quickly get a sense of this how many of us are doing some of this already today uh so have you adapted your current program in the light of covid where we talked about using technology or using community champions etc to say hey some part of this work is already happening are you shifting to addressing an immediate challenge in your community it's not a project but it's a way for you to uh, you know address the need in the community and are you communicating uh, you know you have you adopted your communication are you engaging people joining small groups etc i think it will be great to hear from all of you it's amazing to see how a lot of us have shifted to you know addressing the need of the community a lot more here uh, it's great to know yeah. 
So pretty much at the median here, while well, here we are at the bump. Yeah. Okay, I'll wait till about 50 responses uh, to get a chance and then I'll put with more. Okay, super. It's great to know. And again, I'm sure some of these will come up in the chat and the questions as well. Yeah. Okay, I'll move on. We talked about mitigating, which is more immediate term, internal to the organization. We talked about adapt. What are some of the things that we need to do? Uh, you know, more in terms of uh, uh, the need for uh, the people that we work with and the most critical part of our programs and communication. Pivoting, which is really where do we go from here on in the new reality, I think is a little bit more complicated, you know, uh, because I think A, we, there is a need for us to take a more informed bet of the future world. As you can see, the COVID crisis is going to impact, uh, uh, you know, all of this, uh, across the life cycle, and I apologize for the gender and non-gender neutral image. I just couldn't find something that could give us that impact. Um, I think with infants, for the next six months, both lactating mothers and infants are going to continue, continue, continue to be at risk. And we are not sure what forms of distancing can we actually enable in Anganwadis, you know. Think about young kids in an environment like Anganwadis today, that's a massive risk that we're going to see for the next one year at least. Children and young adults, I think they're going to grow up in a space of loneliness. There is a lot more tension and the risk at home because of uh, the financial crisis that might come up. So kids have to deal with more, uh, have to have more resilience because they will see more violence in their homes. At the same time, we, I don't want to see them as people who will be the people who will be impacted by a problem. The same kids and young adults are the people who are going to give us the solutions to the problems that we are solving in the community. So my thinking is what should we teach our children what should we how should we enable our children empower our children so that they solve the problems that we are facing today you know how do we facilitate that process so that they find solutions rather than be seen as victims of a crisis third is the workforce i think people are going to lose jobs and 92 percent of our workforce is uh, informal which means access to credit access to market linkages logistics challenges are going to hurt them more than anybody else Women's self-help groups are going to look for new ways of working. That's number one. But at the same time, uh, markets are going to reorient themselves. There are new job opportunities that will come. You know, Much like demonetization with changed behavior, there is an inherent hope that two things are going to happen. One, global supply chains will shift from purely China to China and India, which means more manufacturing or downstream jobs, I mean, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs for us. Number one. Two is companies are looking for more decentralized ways of working, So, which means it doesn't have to be centralized in metros. We might have newer ways of getting people to work. What does it mean for each of us? How do we enable the people we are working with so that they get those jobs? Is the fourth, third one. With the elderly, I think it's going to be a huge case of a loneliness and also a perennial risk of uh, mortality. You know, and as nonprofit organizations, I think a for the purpose that we stand for and for the vision we stand for, it's critical to look at all of these and look at what will hence our response be to this crisis and why that is important. I think that's very critical. I haven't put a gender lens to this because each of these and you know issues like safety, for example, at every age of a child is going to become more important as well. So at the moment, honestly, if Sattva tells you that it knows where the world is going to go, if Sattva is lying, and so is every expert out there who's telling you where the world is going to go, because truly we have no plan. And hence, I think what is important is to create an approach where you're agile and you continuously learn, right? The first thing to do is to establish the goals and principles and values of your response, you know? At the leadership level, be very clear what you want to do and how you want to approach this crisis from a morals and principles point of view, you know? Uh, what will you do? What will you not do? You know, at this moment, for example, data from beneficiaries seems like something everybody wants to do. As an organization, do you want to do that or not? You know, you're saying, no, I don't think this is the right time to do something like that. So think about the values and principles that will define your approach first, you know? It might be soft, it might be unknown, but it's good to put some things, at least things that you will not do, you know? So that at least the principles are clear, not the decisions themselves. Second is create the mechanisms for deeply understanding the situation. 
I think the entire leadership of an organization, not just the CEO, have to be connected to the different parts of the ecosystem. You can literally map every ecosystem player, every funder you work with, every nonprofit, every international player you know. You can literally hold a relationship uh, manager inside your organization to say, as a leadership member in this organization, you have to make sure you talk to them at least uh, once a fortnight so that we know what is happening. Foster and build relationships so that you know what is going on. Third is take a few informed bets, but please judiciously, judiciously invest budget and resources. Some of it might have funding immediately. Some of it you want to try out a little bit, but be judicious about it. But the more important thing is to make sure that after you make those decisions, don't stick to it for a very long time. Nonprofits sometimes have had the habit of sticking to bad decisions for much longer because they didn't have the ability to say, no, this is not working, let's move on. This world will require us to make those decisions very, very quickly. So making fast and iterative decisions on this is important. Uh, my suggestion is have a quarterly strategy review, both within the leadership and with the board. To say, these are the bets that we are taking. This is the assumption we are making. Do those assumptions stand true or not? You know, And how can we uh, make that happen? And I think getting people involved in this will be very, very critical. I have some more information on this. Happy to take it as part of the questions as well. The last two slides I want to talk about, and I know I'm running out of time. Uh, one is to make sure that your role in the organization is also clear. The first is as a CEO or a leader in the organization, your psychology is going to make or break the organization and it's true. You know, deep within your heart, you should believe this is an opportunity. You know, that this is something that you are excited about. This is something that you believe you're going to get through effectively and make a larger impact than you, what you envisioned for this year. You know, because that once that shift happens, I think a lot of the organization pivots to that shift fairly rapidly and quickly. You know, and the second is, uh, again, I know it's a soft guideline, but do take care of yourself as a leader. You know, you will constantly be um, sh share. You will probably get the highest stress because of everything that's happening in the ecosystem. So, for example, personally, I started doing yoga after the lockdown started because I realized I have no human interaction and I have to sustain this. Uh, you know, intensity of work for the next six months at least. Uh, so find a way that will give you that ability to take care of yourself. And also before things become bad, you have to know what trade-offs are you willing to take? You know, is it okay for you to fire people? If so, who? How much? Is it okay for you to uh, not have that program that you're running today uh, as a leader? Are you okay with it or not? You know, is it okay for you to move to a smaller office or uh, you know, change your leadership structure, make a big change right now, because everybody else can provide ideas, but it really, at the moment of reckoning, <laughs> you should know what is, what are the big decisions you're willing to make and not willing to make, and I think you work backwards from there. And if you've convinced that it's not something you want to do, uh, you don't want to do, then I think working backwards becomes even more important. Similarly, I think for the leadership team, setting up uh, them into councils, driving specific aspects will be critical, Let's make sure that every leadership member is talking to somebody in the ecosystem. You know, they are not, there are no internal people anymore. It is too risky to have leadership team members who are not talking to the ecosystem. Everybody is distributing webinars among themselves, meetings among themselves, staff conversations, partnerships, etc. And the other thing is for this for the first few weeks, uh, you know, there was a view that okay, there is my business and there is COVID. I think very soon COVID is business. You know, your revenue for next year is. Uh, largely going to be dependent on COVID, not exclusively. It's not going to be only that. But this is not a side project anymore, but it's important to integrate that into the way you're thinking about your overall work. With a board and the advisory committee, I think, uh, you know, depending on the level of engagement you have, I've seen very different types of engagement. Having a subcommittee for uh, re reviewing COVID response is actually a good idea. And having one person there who's your 4AM friend to call, run through ideas, get feedback, especially can help you with fundraising, you know, can open doors for you, I think is very, very important. And the last thing is among all your employees, if there was any ever a time to test the leadership bandwidth of your organization and your succession plan, now is really the time, you know. Uh, pick a set of 20 people if you're a 100 member organization. So 20% of your employee strength uh, should be people who you are putting on new responsibilities where they are learning to manage crisis and you're able to see whether they're able to thrive in that crisis. Mental resilience during this time is going to be very hard to find. You know, if you find somebody who has that, I think that's a great indication for you to build that pipeline for your leadership structure as well. Yeah. 
The very last thing I want to leave with, uh, and again, I've, uh, uh, you know, I think it gives us still 30 minutes for questions. We started Sattva in 2009 to actually enable nonprofit organizations. That's the fundamental tenet with which we started this organization. This work for us is most critical, you know, and we've always looked at ways in which we can enable nonprofit organizations and do it in a manner where we are able to do it sustainably. Uh, so the question for all of you is, where can we support you in this journey? What will be most valuable? We are, and all of these five things are what we are doing already, but it'll be great to get your feedback and thoughts. Yeah. One, we are building tools for what we talked about here, you know, a checklist for mitigation, uh, a little bit of a, a, a more detailed workshop on adapting to this crisis. What can you look at? Getting to the next level of detail, uh, which we are happy to run for organizations or even if a funder is uh, happy to do it for all their uh, you know, nonprofits, we're happy to do that as well. That's number one. Second is we are consolidating knowledge on how different NGOs are responding to this crisis. We've got about 50 case studies so far. We are partnering with other organizations that are doing this as well because we think it's an amazing public good to have to see how different organizations by sector are reacting to this crisis. The third is we have now put in a team to enable implementation, especially where organizations have been funded to respond to the COVID crisis. Uh, because there is, there is there's a lot of thinking, reacting, and agile problem solving. And um, there are, especially people we've worked with before felt that having somebody from Sattva helping them and working with them through this process will be valuable. So we are currently part of at least three different projects that are running in different parts of the country where we are, we are enabling implementation for some of the organizations that are working on directly dealing with the COVID response. Fourth is uh, something that came up in a conversation I had with the CEO. Are there specific problems in sectors, for example, and the example that they gave was how do you use technology today in education? You know, we know for a fact that most families in especially Northern India states don't have smartphones. Now, is there a better way to provide technology-based learning solutions than what we are doing today? Similarly, in livelihoods, are there things that all of us are trying to solve independently that we can solve? Can Sattva hold like a platform or a collaborative that enables collective problem solving among organizations that want to work things together? And that's the fourth one. And the fifth one is maybe a series of webinars like these. You know, every fortnight taking up different topics and sharing with you what we are thinking and what we are learning. I think it'll be great to hear your thoughts on which of this will be valuable, which of this is something that you would want us to invest time on. Um, I'm moving on to, again, uh, the next question, uh, you know, where all of these options are listed. Uh, what we are saying is uh, you can rank these options now as to one to five. So pick up the most important one first and then the next one. Uh, I think it will be great to hear from all of you which ones do you think will be something that will be value for your time and will help you most in this crisis. Great. So clearly the webinar is the last. Um, I think those are more broadcasting models, but I think helping uh, creating for collaborative uh, problem solving on specific sectoral challenges, I think is useful. It's great to know. Yeah, we'll stop. Maybe one more vote and I get to 50 and probably stop. Great, excellent. So thank you. I'm gonna leave this um, here as all of you are voting uh, and as we are getting more uh, responses, uh, I wanna open up the line for questions. Uh, I'd request my colleagues uh, Rahul and Ambika to 
ask any questions that have come from the audience. I know before the webinar, a lot of you uh, shared with us your questions as well. Maybe we start with those questions as they come along and, uh, you know, have uh, new questions that are emerging on the chat on an ongoing basis. Uh, so Rahul and Ambika, if you guys can uh, take the lead and share some of the questions that are coming up. Sure. Thanks, Ritesh. Uh, so thanks everyone for their presence today and for submitting these questions in advance. Uh, we'll also make it a point to go through the uh, questions in the chat window as well. Uh, I think probably one of the most common questions that we saw was related to the funding landscape. Uh, so one question for you, Ritesh, how do you see the landscape of funding evolving in the immediate, mid and long term? Yeah, so I think honestly, we, there are conjectures at this point. I can talk with certainty around what we're seeing on the immediate term, uh, but I also want to share what uh, I mean, you know, how much we can talk about the mid to long term as well. I think um, in the immediate term, uh, in the first week of the uh, you know lockdown, we saw a lot of companies uh, coming to us and saying we are rerouting our money to COVID. Uh, this is something that I think is critical, and let's tell us what to do. So there wasn't clearly an agenda or a plan uh, on what to be what is to be done. A lot of the immediate responses were healthcare, you know, uh, provisioning of equipment largely, uh, and that's really what we saw in the first week. Now in the second week, I think we are on the second or third week. Now we are already seeing people saying uh, beyond health equipment. I mean equipment. Let's look at food migration crisis. Let's look at uh, what can we do in terms of mental health. Let's look at uh, you know still a lot of relief view to the work that they're doing but diversifying with their relief view um, and i think this will continue for the next few months i think that there will be a continued response and again for me like the big inflection point is when the lockdown opens and when people move to rural india you know at the moment we are hearing a lot of talk around the healthcare space the other space that is becoming critical is the livelihood space you know what will happen to livelihoods how do we keep the MSMEs alive? How do we keep craft clusters and other value chains alive? How do we unlock new opportunities for people who have moved to, uh, you know, move back to rural locations? How do we ensure reverse migration continues to sustain itself rather than coming back to migration again? I think that's the second solution or, you know, idea that we're seeing. Uh, third is there are, there's an interest in scalable solutions which short code for technology. So any form of technology solutions, uh, you know, are becoming relevant i mean these are the no voices in the room you know but at the same time and this is what I'm, I'm guessing all of you are seeing but at the same time i want to provide an alternate point of view as well we work in the space of social emotional learning and we've spoken to all the funders that we are working with whether there was any impact on their commitment to social emotional learning and there was and people said no this is this work is important you know similarly i think people are donors are doing two things one is they're saying listen my relationship with my nonprofits are more critical. So they're actually doing a call out to their nonprofit organization saying, can you provide me a way in which you want to respond to the crisis? And I'm happy to repurpose it accordingly and work this way. That's number one. The donors are also saying that there's a certain percentage of my money is going to go to uh, COVID, but the rest of the money we're going to still keep for continuing the work that we are doing. Yeah. So the immediate response, up, you know, like literally the day of the lockdown or the day after, there was a lot of uh, certain noise. But I think there is a certain median within which I think things are starting to fall. I think that's a big chunk is still going to be uh, relief related in the next one to two months. After that, there will be a big bump on healthcare and livelihoods for sure. But my own sense is that it's not going to be exclusively that. I think there will be a, a bell curve that is going to form uh, where people will start to realize that uh, societies are complex systems. You're not going to solve a problem by fixing one thing in a society, right? Irrespective of what the crisis is. And I think it's just a question of time for those symptoms to kind of come in. I think the responsibility hence, and I'll talk about the midterm a little bit, the responsibility hence for nonprofit leaders is to actually craft that narrative, you know? Talk about how systems like these are not simple. It's not like you have a health problem, you'll solve health. You will have to focus on the gender problem. You will have to invest in children and young people to be problem solvers today, you know? And I think building that narrative is gonna become very, very critical. So that's, I think, the short-term view. Our own Satwa's view on the midterm really, I think is, um, and again, this is speculation entirely. I have very little data to substantiate it barring what is happening globally. I think in the, in the next one or two years, I feel like there is gonna be a strong focus in 
finding ways to strengthen our, our healthcare systems uh, at the state level. Uh, you know, and that's not just healthcare. It's about how do we engage women better? How do we look at new forms of livelihoods that are healthcare related? I think there is a lot of strengthening our healthcare infrastructure in the organizations going to become critical. Second, I feel like empowering the economy and bringing it back on track. I think from uh, subsidies to all of that is going to become critical. That means impact on work readiness in uh, higher education, impact on uh, jobs, gig economy, uh, impact on women-based groups, uh, to MSMEs, loans. I think there is a lot of that, uh, you know, if the exchequer has capital, I think, and where the foundations will come in. I think the third part of it is uh, social security. I think social protection and looking at insurance, looking at uh, essential entitlement deliveries, uh, better support for migrant workers, uh, better laws around that, I think will be helpful. Uh, and I think it's something that we will see a lot more advocacy for and hopefully more reception. And last, I'll say that the way we reimagine education for, uh, you know, uh, for um, the new world, the post-COVID world, how do we create more problem solvers? How do we look at social distancing? How do we engage parents more? How do we look at schools as places where education happens, but home is where it actually thrives? I think those things will become more critical. And the final thing that we have to focus on is food and nutrition. I think food and nutrition, uh, and not just as an immediate food crisis, but overall, I think will continue to be a focus, I think, going forward. So those are my personal uh, sense of where the funding might evolve. But like I said, you know, we, society is a complex system, and I think we still don't know which part of the society is going to flare up because of what we are seeing. Uh, and I think we just have to watch. Uh, Thanks, Rahul. Any, I hope that answered the question, Rahul. Can we move to the second one? Sure. Uh, another common question that came in in advance, and I think is evident on the uh, mentee form as well, was uh, how can NGOs look to co collaborate in the response or relief efforts? Uh, this could be with other NGOs, with government, private sector, any other type of stakeholder as well. How can NGOs best collaborate in the response and relief efforts? Yeah, I think that uh, two things. I think one is, uh, you know, for nonprofits to figure out their playing field uh, overall as an organization is very important, right? Like I, I was talking about this earlier as well in another uh, conversation. People define themselves as education NGOs. People define themselves as uh, I'm a community-based organization. I think those labels are probably too narrow at the moment. Yeah. My request to you all is to uh, think of your definitions more broadly. You know, what could you be? Uh, can be very different and that might define your playing field. So think about what your capabilities are as an organization and think about how those capabilities can be relevant. And hence, you knowing your playing field, areas where you, be, where you will have a distinct advantage to solve a problem is, I think, very critical before you start collaborating with partners because partners collaborate when they know that there is a com complementary strength that the other organization is able to bring to that collaboration. Rather than, you know, my like one of our mentors says, two, poor, two poor people never made a rich person, you know? So finding that strength and capability in your playing field, I think, is very critical, number one. Second is, I think, um, and I hope this happens, is greater empathy for the different types of stakeholders that we are working with, you know? Uh, corporates are uh, short term, governments are too slow. I mean, there is going to be a lot of that, uh, you know, the notion of uh, our own prejudice is going to get questioned in the post-COVID world if you're looking at collaboration. I think those are two maybe ground rules. In terms of uh, how to collaborate, I think a couple of examples that I'm seeing which are, I think, interesting to see. One, I think on aspects like food relief, you know, I think it was amazing to see how there is a need for three, three separate skills, right? There is a need for a supply chain skill. There is a need for a fundraising skill for food and there is a need for delivery at the community level. You know, finding the right set of partnerships to deliver and orchestrate solutions like these, I think will be a great way to think about how collaborations can actually work, number one, right? Second, I think it would be great to find ways to not solve the same problem 15 times individually. So if there are better ways to solve, you know, common problems all of us are facing across sectors and create a common agenda, and find great ways to engage and do this remotely, which is going to be a challenge. I think that will have a significant impact as well. I think with the government, uh, two things are happening in parallel. One is we are in touch with about 12 state government, eight state governments at the moment, and almost all of them are looking, asking us about nonprofits that are doing a certain type of work. So there is a willingness among specific states, uh, especially, to create a response framework for it. 
uh, where nonprofits can be a part of, you know. So be in touch with, uh, you know, players like us or governments directly. I think making an offer for where you want, where you can help, I think will be helpful. The second, I think, which is important is, I think working with the government, especially at the leadership level, to create a framework for that collaboration is important. I don't think it's set very well today. You know, it's very transactional. Uh, it's very immediate. But I think given this relationship is going to continue for the six to 12 months, putting a certain framework, especially nonprofit leaders who have that ability to think through, evangelize and influence government stakeholders, think about it effectively, I think will be very, very useful. Like in somebody in like in Mumbai, for example, working with like Pradesh or somebody like that, or you know, in other states and cities, to put that framework together with the principal secretary or the chief secretary, I think will actually be very useful for us uh, as we go along. Uh, hi. Any other questions? I'm sorry, can we also mute and reduce the noise that we're facing? So the other question Great. that's come thanks, up Shruti. is, yeah, yeah, thanks, Rahul. Next question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another question uh, was people related. So uh, one question was, um, you know, NGO. So NGOs are there on the front line kind of responding. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Go ahead. Hello. Uh -huh. So NGOs are there on the front line uh, responding to the crisis. And how does the uh, organization balance both the providing relief and rehabilitation to communities and also staff safety and duty of care? Yeah. So yeah, it is a tough question. And I don't know. And again, it's a very contextual question as well. But I want to I mean, at least share some thoughts from my side of what uh, I am seeing other organizations that are doing this, uh, you know, uh, have put in place. And it's not that it's perfect, but it's a great place to start. One is, I think, at a leadership level, like I said, deciding what is urgent and important at this moment is very critical. You know, not all your program goals are going to be met now. Some of your program goals are not even relevant to this reality. So I think making a decision of this is really urgent and important. This is what we have to do now. I think is very, very critical first. Second is, again, like we discussed, look at technology, look at champions, look at all ways in which your staff don't have to be on the ground right now. And there are some really good examples that are coming up, uh, you know, like I said, the use of IVR, the use of helpline numbers, the use of teleconferencing, things that we wouldn't have used with uh, people before, I think are important. That's the second one. Third is make working on the ground an optional and a voluntary option for your program staff. You know, I know this is a difficult decision, but telling your staff that, listen, we understand that your family and you are at risk and it's maybe not, maybe not something that they want to do right now. They maybe have a young child. They maybe have a very elderly person and they just don't feel right to be working on the ground right now. So if there is a way to make your program staff's uh, roles more voluntary to go on the field and find ways to engage them on the phone, you know, use them for engaging others on the phone and other ways if possible or knowledge management documentation, I think will be useful, but providing that gesture of saying, being on the field is a voluntary choice, right? It's not something that you will foist on them. I think will be, uh, will be the third one. Uh, the fourth one is don't just provide guidelines, make it a training program if it's possible, you know? Uh, what do we have to do? Get, I mean, like Noura Health, for example, talked about providing sensitization training for people on COVID. You know, so if there is a medical representative that can actually tell you what is okay, not okay, what is absolutely no go, uh, you know, what essential equipment do you absolutely need uh, and making sure all of that is available, I think is very important as well. That's the fourth one. Five is please do internal checks and empower, I mean, set up the essential infrastructure. If you need a, a thermometer, for example, which is non, uh, you know, touch thermometer that is available right now, whatever is possible, because there is really no moral high ground in keeping our employees at risk while enabling community. Because as we know, an employee who's at risk, this means the entire community is at risk because they engage with community so much, right? So it's extremely critical to make sure that all of these things are there. I think there are many ways, if you be creative about it, there are many ways in which our field staff don't have to be on the ground. I think finding ways to do that is very, very important. There are some problems which require us to be on the ground. And I think it's a reality. But for that, making those options voluntary, ensuring there is training, ensuring there are strict guidelines. Think about how Unilever implements safety in there among their employees, right? It's just that level of rigor in our nonprofits. And the third is to make sure that 
there is a review mechanism and there is infrastructure that is in place, I think are all critical to do. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Any other Great. questions? Yeah, a few other coming up. Uh, one related to m &E. So um, now uh, NGOs are responding on the ground. Uh, current programs might not be, I mean, they might be put on hold, they might be shifting and adapting in different ways. How do we look at m &E, um, you know, when we get immediate funding for relief? How do we look at m &E when it comes to kind of ongoing programs and so forth? Any thoughts there? I think there are two questions here and I probably want to unbundle both of them. Uh, one is to um, look at how do you do m and &E for a program that's probably not running as well as it should because of the reality on the ground. So my request is, as I said in the beginning, have an upfront conversation with your donor and as much as possible, let's repurpose or postpone or find a way to use the grant more effectively rather than doing something because there is a program outcome that has to be shown. You know, I think uh, the the in, in our conversations with donors, everybody seems to approach this with the right level of sensitivity and uh, you know sensibility. Uh, so I think uh, the M and E is probably not the problem, but uh, repurposing the grant with the with the donor and telling them this is the most most relevant thing to do at the moment. Uh, you know, I, I know I, I told you that I'll stitch 50,000, uh, you know, clothes at the moment, but my women cannot come into the same, you know, work floor, but so we can do something else. And I think finding them to agree on that, I think will be very, very useful. That's number one. The second question that I think that is there is a lot of immediate relief work might not have the a level of rigor, uh, you know, that, uh, that a regular program will have. It might not have an LFA, you know, we are, we are in the middle of a crisis, right? Uh, again, I think it's extremely important and relevant to communicate the same to the donors as well. This is not a um, pre-mediated, low externality program, which is predictable and will work out of an LFA. This is the relief operation. And the ME &E for a relief operation is very, very different. I think what we can tell them is, A, we will measure, ensure strong compliance and governance so that we know that the money is spent in the right things, the resources bought are used well, the procurement is clear so that, you know, money, because there is a risk of, uh, you know, the, the resources being lesser. So I think that is something that you can guarantee. Two is you can guarantee qualitative case studies to say, this is what we are seeing. But, you know, I think it's fair to tell them that uh, an outcome framework, midterm, long-term outcomes to an immediate relief operation does not make much sense at all, you know. And again, in my, uh, in our case as well, we've so now, I think there are about 32 opportunities related to COVID that we are talking to donors about. Everything is a two page proposal, you know, uh, there's no 17 page proposal, seven approval cycles, et cetera. There is, things are becoming a lot more streamlined because uh, companies realize the speed is of essence. They also realize there's only so much all of us know about the current reality. So I think to push back and to do that well and to do it as a partner, I think is a, is an appropriate response at this time. Great. Thanks, Ratish. Uh, another question, this is a little bit more stakeholder specific. We've been seeing a lot of it um, in the media and so forth. How can NGOs support during uh, reverse migration um, of different kind of migrant laborers and so forth, both during uh, the COVID crisis, uh, like right now, and even post the lockdown? Any thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to give case studies. I think um, Gram Vikas in Orissa is a great organization uh, that's been working in the, you know, um, working on, uh, you know, destigmatization of uh, people who have uh, come back from urban areas. You know, uh, there is a massive crisis that people in the rural area see them uh, as potentially carriers of, uh, you know, an illness. And they are actually working on sensitization and the destigmatization workshops on the ground to make sure that the migrants are treated well. And they're also ensuring that the migrants are trained and sensitized and they've put in effective quarantine mechanisms in limited environments that we have in rural areas today. It's not the way we talk about it here. I think that is definitely going to be one uh, critical uh, sort of a response. Second is, you know, the, um, the the food crisis is real. You know, it is not, and I know, like in the beginning, I thought it was a temporary problem of a few days, but I think from what we are seeing, it is not going to be something that uh, is going to abate or go away fairly quickly, given there is a very strong chance that the lockdown is going to be extended. So finding ways in transits, especially, and in ways, uh, you know, that uh, where, wherever there are settlements, neither in the source nor in the distribution, but in transit, 
where reverse migrants are uh, you know are stuck i think supporting them there beyond the gurgaons and the mumbais of the world i think is an, another important thing that i think is very critical uh, third is a lot of the migrant workers that that are traveling don't have the pocw cards a large part of migrants are construction workers they don't register themselves with the construction welfare board and hence they don't get most of the entitlement so there is a need for advocacy working with them and making sure that uh, you know um, they actually get the entitlements that they need and that requires your ability to liaison with the administrative officials district officials to make that happen i think that's the third important thing fourth is financial inclusion for uh, you know informal workers migrant workers is going to become a reality and people will not know how to give that money and how to get that money well so if you do have access to communities working with financial providers in making that uh, transfers happen effectively and and if there are ways to make it conditional cash transfers that are you know humanitarian but at the same time reinforcing constructive behavior i think that would be a great idea uh, to kind of implement so can you put a certain condition for the families to get money in a manner that actually promotes their well being rather than being something that impedes them from getting the money i think that would be another important thing and the last idea that uh, i mean and i think the most obvious one is some of these migrants don't have to come back you know so be it agriculture be it other forms of uh, livelihood uh, you know uh, are there ways in which we can create those value chains that are more effective uh, because you know there is you know there is a great book by asa duplo and abhijit banerjee where they talk about trade offs of migration you know is always a risk and opportunity trade off that they are doing a lot of the covid crisis will heighten the risk factor for migration from among people you know and hence the opportunity does not seem as attractive anymore so there will be people who might not take to the city but actually might just stay in the village and continue to be unemployed and and uh, uh, and hence making sure that we providing a meaningful livelihood opportunities for them who are settling for that sort of a livelihood structures in rural areas that can help them thrive and grow i think will also become very very critical great very informative uh another kind of organizational question um how should uh, ngos kind of approach operational planning um you know the financial year is just starting now uh people have put together their plans their budgets and so forth how should they approach operational planning this annual kind of planning exercise and maybe even if you could break that out in terms of q1 uh because this is kind of uh, a lot of um uncertainty there but q1 and even the the rest of the financial year yeah i think uh, so one is i don't know if now is a good time to do annual planning at all yeah my suggestion is to do only q1 planning don't do annual planning it's a lot of effort that uh, you will put in to a reality that none of us know what we are waking up to unless you have non negotiables uh, that you are putting in place i think that's the first uh, uh, you know piece of uh, what i would um, to catch number one yeah so i think think of it as a q1 plan and then q2 to q4 is possible but q1 plan is probably a good plan right now second is i think the uh, there is a framework called the okr framework the objective and key results framework so non profits sometimes do make plans that are more predictable plans that are gants like we will do this activity this activity this activity etc which might not be possible in q1 so it might be useful to think of outcomes you want to achieve rather than activities that you will do and i think that's a shift in the way you conduct your operational planning you will have to say that okay by q1 we'll have to get x amount of grants and funding we'll have to reduce our cost by 70% we'll have to ensure zero unwanted attrition and we want to do you know um, improve our it infrastructure overall in case of prolonged uh, you know work from home models so that's these are all key results you know uh, and now through the through the week through the months the ways to achieve this subject was my change but the objectives will become not stars for you to keep the focus you know i think that way of planning overall i think might be very useful number one second is i think the operational plan itself should cover i think the four things that we talked about uh, earlier one is the financial sustainability plan which is how much money do we need how much money do we uh, you know have to kind of uh, uh, do, can we minimum work with what are our big decisions what is the descending order of choices you're going to make uh, you know uh, in terms of cost cutting and cost optimization the second plan is your employee wellbeing plan what are you going to do in q1 to make sure that our employees are safe uh, they are mentally okay and they continue to thrive and how are you going to change your working models etc and the third plan would be the uh, the plan around uh, uh, the programs uh, themselves and how do you want to 
run the programs, what programs make sense, what programs don't, uh, which ones would you want to continue and which ones do you want to create now, what are the new pilots that you're running from a program point of view. Uh, the fourth one will be your uh, operations and systems plan, what internal systems do you want to create uh, and uh, you know what systems do you want to kind of uh, deprioritize for the moment. Uh, you know, I think like for example people performance plans, you know, I mean it's an important decision for an organization Do we continue to do it or not do it in Q1. I think that's the, the that's the fourth one. And overarching all of this is your stakeholder communication plan. How do you do that? I think if your operational plan can have these four or five categories can have clear results and not just activities on what do you want to measure as success for each of these that could be a great place to start for an operation. Group. Wonderful. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, just, I guess, if you want to use the next few minutes, just kind of wrap up, uh, we were able to touch up on a number of the questions, not all, we apologize for that. The dialogue is always open, but if you'd like to kind of um, use the rest of the time to kind of summarize and wrap up. Yeah, so number one, I think, like we said, we, we want to try and keep this as an ongoing conversation. Um, uh, we are at Satwa planning this as a series of uh, webinars. We have one on the 21st, which is on ME. Uh, there was a question on ME as well. So, how do you look at ME in the light time of COVID? I think is one thing that uh, you know we want to do. Uh, two is to thank you for your feedback on what is most relevant. I think we are very excited about uh, taking a collaborative approach uh, to uh, you know solving some of the sector-specific problems. We need to frame that effectively, but we want to do that in the coming week. Uh, we will reach out to you asking you to sign up uh, if you are interested in that and also sharing with us any questions you might have. So as you, when you get a feedback email, you would have a question on, would you want to join a collaborative working group of uh, solving a problem with sectors and what type of questions are on your minds that this collaborative should solve for? I think giving us your input on that will be very, very helpful. Uh, we will continue to build our uh, tools and uh, frameworks uh, to, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, we are able to make them available for you. Uh, we do want to make sure that there are, there are free resources available as much as possible and wherever we are able to convince donors to do this for an entire cohort of organizations or wherever you would think it will be possible for us to work with you directly happy to do a one two day workshop where we are able to really flesh out and build this plan together with you as well um, but again the principle for us is the, is this right is the fact that we've always believed that sattva that for any problem to be solved uh, at scale in this country, we need robust organizations, either as for-profit social enterprises or as non-profit organizations. And uh, unless that layer is strong, I think the, we are not we are far from prepared for the crisis that we are facing at the moment. And uh, we're super committed to doing everything we can from our side to making that happen. You know, and uh, I know it's a uh, we're out of time and it's probably, uh, you know, we don't have too much time, we have two minutes, but I still want to go do what we talked about earlier, which is how do you, how are you feeling right now? Is there anything that you're taking back, any feedback that you would give us, I think will be uh, useful to hear at the moment. So I'm just going to take, uh, you know, a slide as we are in the last few minutes and try and get your feedback at the moment. So last question on Mentimeter, I think it should come up on your screens. Any feedback you have, how are you feeling at the end of the webinar? It'd be great to hear from all of you. If you're still confused, it's okay to say so, but if it was helpful, uh, I think it'll be great to hear. Fantastic. Still confused. Thank you for your honesty. I think it is. Um, if there's anything that we can share online or through our FAQ or so on, do let us know. Um, you know, we'd love to keep the conversation going. Great. Uh, again, as as these uh, words keep coming, and uh, you know, uh, as you let us know, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you. 
Uh, we will send out the presentation deck uh, that we had, uh, you know, as we promised earlier. We will also send you a form uh, that helps us uh, plan our next steps. And if there are any questions that we were unable to take, uh, we will try our best to make sure that we can share with you our responses offline as well. Uh, so that uh, you know we we are able to make sure that the questions that you had were answered. Yeah. Thanks again so much for joining us today. I hope this was helpful. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch. With you.